When I hear the term recovery, I think of moving to a better state than the one that's currently being experienced. Some examples would be recovery from illness, recovery from addictions, and in fact, financial recovery. There are a number of events and circumstances that press in on us in life that we desire to recover from for, to a better state. In your printed program, you see that the title of my presentation is What Made the Difference? In this talk, I will review and describe some of the recoveries that I have had to experience as I move forward in fulfilling my destiny. When I began to prepare for this presentation, I realized that I'm a product of a whole race of people who got their start in America by having to recover, by having to overcome, in order to victoriously move from where they were to something far better. Therefore, when I look at my recoveries along life's journey, I realize that my ancestors have already paved the way by their recovery through slavery. So I view recovery as a continuum. And then therefore all I'm doing is adding to a rich legacy that has already been established. I will start with my family background, concentrating mainly on my parents. I will move to my early years. I will examine my career path. And then I'll close with three main points that I hope will serve as food for thought for anyone that's in need of recovery in order to move forward in life. My parents provided me with a foundational set of lessons as a young boy that have served me well even to now, to this day. They can be summarized in three main points. One, they said, always stand firmly on the spiritual foundation that you were introduced to as a boy and never stray from it. Number two, they said, reach for the stars, aim high. Always hold on to your dreams and aspirations. Never let them fade away, no matter what. And third, they said, develop an impeccable work ethic that will surpass everything in everything that you do. While slavery had been abolished over 80 years before I was born, I entered a world under the Jim Crow laws which legally mandated the complete isolation and separation of blacks and whites in every facet of public life. As a young boy, I looked at this oppressive system and said, well, how, how does one overcome, how does one recover to something better from such a start in life? And in fact, I said, uh, is it possible for one to recover? And then I locked on to something. And that's something that I locked on to was work. I tested my theory of work by seeking work in establishments where the legal laws said I could not go. And I noticed that once I got inside these places, there was a measure of respect that was afforded me, not based on the color of my skin, but it was based on the content and quality of my work. Looking at what work was doing for me in the manual labor area, I decided to move that same work ethic into the educational arena. And so I approached my academics by working extremely hard. And I wanted to set the bar where I wanted 
people to try to, try to out, outwork me. That was what I found out in the, in, the, in, the, in the academic area is that the same way that work in the manual labor area had moved me up, I found that I could recover in the education arena the same way. And in fact, when I graduated from high school, based on my work ethic, I won a four-year academic scholarship to college. When I got to college, I continued that impeccable work ethic that afforded me a fellowship to this very university where I stand on the stage tonight, Howard University, from my work ethic. When I arrived at Howard, there was chaos in the land, 1969. Chaos everywhere, turmoil, unsettling and unrest. What was the source of this unrest? What was causing all of this? The nation was trying to come to grips with change. It was a change that they were going to have to deal with, but it was giving them growing pains in doing that. We can go back as far as the Civil Rights Act when it was passed into law in 1964, troubling the land. We can go back to the passing of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Turmoil in most major cities, including Washington, D.C., from the Vietnam War and all of the disturbance and the, and, and the violence that was plaguing our land to the point that April 1968, Martin Luther King was assassinated. And if that wasn't enough for an unsettled nation, then two months later, in June of that same year, 1968, presidential candidate Robert Kennedy was assassinated. It was under these conditions that I arrived at Howard University. But what I noticed when I got here was that the same work ethic that I was taught as a boy, that if I duck my head and pay attention, the noise level was high, but I found that work was doing the same thing. I'm going to give what I call a commercial break here, an advertisement. And it's for an organization called the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Why am I doing this? I'm doing this because every individual that are, that's in need of recovery, they need a support system. If you're sick, you need doctors and nurses. And in fact, if you're sick enough, you need a hospital itself. If you need financial recovery, you need to sit with financial experts who can put you back on track. So it was in the employment area. This nation needed help because there was a cadre of people that looked like us who were left out of the job market. And while EEOC was founded and established in 1965, it didn't get its teeth until 1973. What do I mean by getting its teeth? Getting its teeth means this. In 65, all of the regulatory laws were on the books, but none were being enforced and implemented. In 1973, the government said, we are going to do something about that. And it turns out I was on the receiving end of it, in that I became the first black PhD scientist in the corporation that I joined. Isolation, loneliness, cultural differences, trying to come to grips with do I belong, being challenged every day, even though we had the technical skills. I understood that I had to build my courage up. My faith had to get stronger. If I was going to survive, it had to get much stronger than it was. Let me tell you what building a better mousetrap has to do with this recovery talk that I'm giving this afternoon. When I arrived to head the X-ray diffraction and atomic absorption laboratory, my second week on the job, I arrived and an inspector is there. The inspector was there to survey my lab and upon surveying it, his findings were that my lab was out of compliance in that it had high levels of scattered radiation 
that was harmful to my employees and harmful to visitors to my laboratory. And he said in the report, I'm going to give this company 60 days to repair this problem. And I'm coming back in 60 days, and if it's not repaired, I'm shutting this lab down. When he left, I immediately said this was set up. How could I arrive at this campus-like R&D facility? Labs everywhere. In fact, the building I was working in had three floors of labs, and mine was the only one that was contaminated. I did not have the luxury to, in my mind to say that this is, 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 is a setup. I had to go to work. And what I did was I went all the way back to my childhood days when my father and I worked on cars. My father, a third grade educated, brilliant, self-taught man that could restore and recover all kinds of machinery. When my design was placed on the equipment, it looked as if it came from the factory that way. And in fact, in life, we have to recover from a lot of things. And sometimes we have to recover from our own ignorance. At 25 years old, I knew nothing about intellectual property. I knew nothing about intellectual ideas, creative thought, and the, and the economic power of those. But what I did know is when the president of the corporation that made the instrument came to my lab with his chief scientist to ask me questions like, where did you get this idea from? How did you know it would work? Why this material? I answered everything. And while they were writing their answers, something came over me saying that something's wrong with this picture. And it was years later before I understood what the real issues were in intellectual capital and how to protect your ideas. Moved to my second job and the first black PhD scientist, PhD scientist there. But the difference was I didn't internalize anymore. I put my competence on the top shelf and I began to develop a broader picture of who Robert Louis Shepard could become. And in doing so, it became clear to me that God was using me as a bridge builder so that those who would come behind me would have it a little less uh, difficult than I did. As it continued, I always went back to the days of when I sat in the lab with the instrument maker, and that led me to create three businesses. Two were nonprofits, 501c3s, and the one that I have now, the Shepherd Institute, is a limited liability corporation. All of that came from that one experience. So what made the difference in my life? Three pillars. I learned early in my life that work was my friend. Work was my friend in the manual labor area and in the intellectual area. When I connected courage and faith tighter, that's when a broader vision of who I could become crystallized in my mind. And then I fully understood that God was right there with me all the step of the way. So what do I want to leave with you this afternoon? The universe is full of individuals who are unique and they have a divine purpose. But the question that I'll ask all of you, how many will recover to something better. Thank you. Are there any questions? No questions? Yes, OK. Thank you so much. Um, if I could just honor the question by asking you, as I was listening to you, here we're sitting here, and I just saw the connection, this genome <laughs> that each of us has. Mm. Our, as I say, our ultimate expression of life. Science has now brought us to a point that really shows that. We are engineered, designed. I like to call it the genome STEM, the science of the genome, the technology, the engineering, the mathematics of the gene. We are designed to manifest that larger life. Okay. And 
I think the experience is that many of us, particularly African Americans, but not limited, but simply because of our history, are on the front line of now using the best that science has to offer to demonstrate. I call science a Thomas ministry okay. to show that reality. We are made, we're made to glorify God. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I concur with that. And as the young lady is coming to the mic, what I'm going to say to that, I know it wasn't a question, but what I'm going to say to it is, it links with the presentation from our two speakers here. There has got to come a time where the traditional classroom work and the approach that we are taking, it's got to be reversed. Something new, it's got to be like a paradigm shift. And I was delighted to hear my two brothers here and the young people that are here uh, need to go back and tell their friends who are not here that on the horizon is something that can change their lives. Because going to school every day today, thinking about getting enough education to go work a job or a career, that's a thing of the past. So the issue is, how do we bring this kind of thought to this classroom, to this university, so that Howard can continue to be the capstone of black education, the mecca of, of education? Because I can say that if that doesn't happen, they're losing ground. They may not, it's like the, the vanishing shoreline. You don't see the shoreline vanishing, but it's vanishing. And so it is with Howard. So I appreciate their presentation. Yes, ma'am. Shepard, thank you so much for that um, inspiring presentation. Thank you. So my question was, um, I'm curious about how you resolved your first position, your job, um, with the radiation. How did you resolve that, and how can we, what kind of takeaway can you give us in adversary situation like that where we seem like the, you're in a position where you can't, there's no way, but you made a way. Right. So how, I mean, how can you... In, you know, as a student here, I'm a doctoral student here in political science. Okay. How, you know, how could someone like me or my, my fellow colleagues and cohort, you know, overcome barriers that may seem impossible? Yeah, yeah. It comes from within. You have to capture at some point a bigger vision of who you are. You can't believe everything that is being said to you that, that that's who you are you can capture a much, much bigger vision. And when you do, the thought process is going to be elevated and you're gonna come up with things that you couldn't even imagine possible. So what I would say to you is that continue to, to think outside the box. It's okay to do that sometimes. The company which sent me to, my company sent me to the company that made the instrument who claimed that they had a, a solution. Their solution was uh, thousands of dollars, if I recall, I think it was $50,000, the design that they came up with. Well, before I left my lab, I had taken a sheet of paper and put right down where they said the leak point was, five centimeters from the housing, and it just stopped all the radiation. And I said, well, why pay? And I treated their money like my money. I wouldn't have taken 50000 of my money to pay for it, and I did that design for $500. Okay. So, so think outside the box, and, and it'll, it'll work for you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.